on the end on what what happens because of noise right and i would like to start off with an anecdote and i i apologize if you heard this before but well anyways while while working on this project uh, after a long day i just wanted to you know relax and escape from it a bit so i decided to read some science fiction uh so i started reading this novel called recursion i cannot really recommend it so uh as you and then i opened the book and i found the following passage ever heard of d-wave slate asks as elena takes a sip of white burgundy the best wine she has ever tasted so as you can tell from this passage the the writing is a bit corny but uh the main uh, message for this talk is that right now it's kind of difficult to escape from the hype surrounding NISC devices, right? And so in this book, the main character goes on and reshapes reality. Uh, and the main tool she uses to achieve that are some computations she performs on a D wave machine. So we can tell that the expectations for what we can achieve with these quantum devices we already have, we are gonna build in the near future, are pretty high. Now, um, so the guiding question of this talk is, is it realistic to expect NIST devices to really reshape our reality? Or maybe we can be a bit less ambitious and say, uh, ask the question, is it um, to be expected that we're gonna obtain unequivocal quantum speed ups for optimization using such devices? So, and this is, will be the guiding question of this talk. And um, I'll be focusing on the limitations imposed by the noise. And we're gonna conclude that the opportunity window for reshaping the reality using this device is this sort of slim. So um, yeah, let's get a bit more technical. And of course, feel free to interrupt me at any time if, if anything is, is not clear, okay? So what are the problem times we're gonna consider in this talk? So we're going to assume we are given some Hamiltonian H and the ground state encodes the solution to a problem we want to solve. So uh, in principle, the technique I'm going to expose here uh, can, be class, um, can be applied to both H classical or quantum. So by classical, I just mean diagonal and the computational basis. But I will focus on classical problems uh, here because it's simpler and also because we have a more complete picture in this case. So uh, you should really think that I have some sort of uh, easing Hamiltonian, okay? Um, and I want to find its ground state. And um, so finding the ground state of such easing Hamiltonians is, is uh, equivalent to, for instance, solving a uh, max cut for a graph or many other NP-complete problems. And um, this can be just formulated as minimizing this thing over here. So the traits of HI, uh, phi D rho, where this phi D we're gonna assume is a depth D quantum circuit. And, um, and we're gonna assume that this is very important. There's no error correction going on or, and we don't have access to fresh qubits or whatever. Uh, so this is the setting we're gonna be in. So you just you know wanna find the ground state of this uh, Hamiltonian by running this circuit uh, on a noisy quantum device with no error correction. Okay, so um, what is the, the noise model we're gonna consider? We're gonna suppose we wanna implement some unitary circuit. Okay, so we wanna implement unitaries U1 until UI, starting from the all zero state. Uh, this is gonna produce this, this output over here. But we're going to assume that these noisy unitaries are interspersed by some noisy quantum channel. So after each unitary, we have this quantum channel that uh, models the noise of our system. And uh, we're going to assume it to be the same uh, over time, uh, homogeneous in time, but this is not really that important. And for now, uh, just assume that this T is one qubit depolarizing noise. So, you know, each of these wires is affected by one qubit depolarizing noise with the polarizing probability P. Uh, but this is like just a toy model. In principle, the technique can be applied to more general noise models. And later, I'm going to discuss uh, also how to deal 
with noise models that are uh, non unital that that is that don't mit, uh, map the maximally mixed state to itself. Uh, and also how to deal with noise models in, in continuous time, because we're going to also see how to apply um, this technique, not only to the circuit model, but also to um, quantum manures, where we have continuous time. Okay. So how does this noisy quantum channel we have there constrain the performance of such algorithms, right? Um, so again, we are in a setting where we have the polarizing noise probability P after each unitary. Uh, and the intuition would be that we lose it, the quantum advantage at depth more or less one over P, because at this depth uh, with um, high probability, we've seen at least one uh, error per qubit, right? Uh, so we would expect that at this depth, we are quantum computer is no longer doing anything that is that useful. And we rigorously confirm the situation. So what we show is that roughly at that P to the minus one, the um, sampling from the output of this quantum computer uh, performs as well as sampling from a high temperature Gibbs state, okay, which you can do easily classically. So in some sense, we confirm that, you know, like what, whatever this quantum computer is doing, it's performing at least as well as something you can easily do on a, on a classical computer. And we're going to make this formal in a couple of slides. But, you know, uh, you high temperature Gibbs sampling is not how you would solve these problems in practice. Um, and you also, we also want to analyze how well this noisy quantum computer is performing against the heuristic algorithms people use in practice, right? Because those are the ones we will have to beat if we want to claim a useful quantum advantage. Um, so another very natural question is, at which depth do noisy quantum computers lose advantage against non-trivial classical algorithms? And that take non-trivial uh, either to mean like a very good polynomial time algorithm as say STP, relaxation of the problem, or even again, the, the, the algorithms people use in practice. Um, and it is important to decouple how difficult it is to simulate a noisy quantum circuit from how useful it is to solve a structure problem, right? So for instance, assume we're given a, a quantum device with 800 qubits, uh, a 2D architecture and 1% the polarizing rate. So simulating this device at intermediate depths is highly non-trivial and probably out of reach with current techniques. But this doesn't really mean that we can use it to solve uh, useful problems, right? So um, what we then show, for instance, is that whenever a good classical algorithm is available, then advantage is lost at depths C to the P minus one. So in principle, the scaling is the same, but this constant C here can be much smaller than one. Uh, so for instance, in the setting I was describing before where we had these 800 qubits, even with 1%, the polarizing rate, we can show that already at depth 18, we do not expect um, this, this quantum computer to actually uh, offer um, advantage. Okay. What do you mean by good so, classical algorithm? Like, I mean, say, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so the I, I I am being very vague on purpose here. Uh, so, um, you know, the 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 technique I'm gonna describe it essentially lets you it, let's say you're given the output of a algorithm, any algorithm you want. It can be heuristic and can be an SCP, whatever you want, and then you can estimate at which at which step the expected value of the output of the noisy quantum circuit is. Um, is worse than that. So, and then we, we ran it for some, some instances, some concrete instances and got these numbers like comparing to other solvers. But um, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to give you more details about that a bit later. So you say both the quantum and classical are bad actually, but quantum becomes, it becomes even worse. Is, is it... uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, so the, this, this Gibbs sampler at which we lose advantage at order P to the minus one, 
is is not is not what you would do in in practice. But the 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 quantum becomes even worse than that at at depths larger than p to the minus one. And then here we try to compare to what you would actually do in practice. So these are like two complementary results. Um, any further questions before I explain how we actually get these things on the setup or anything? Okay. If not, then let's just compare to, to previous work. So, um, of course, uh, we're not the first ones to ask when noise makes quantum computers useless in some sense. Uh, we are not even the first ones to use entropic inequalities to analyze that, uh, which are like at the core of our techniques. So, for instance, I like to point out the works by Aronov, Aharonov, sorry, Gottesman, uh, or Milo Um, But as far as I know, uh, these all have slightly different setups than ours, although I would say they're comparable, but they obtain less stringent bounds on the maximal depth. So some of them also allow for error correction and other things which we don't really do in, 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 in this setup, uh, but uh, they don't get system size independent bounds like the one I just described. Like they get uh, bounds that scale at least logarithmically with system size. Um, and I would also like to point out these other works, which are in the spirit of so-called reverse threshold theorems. So these are much stronger statements um, in the sense that they guarantee that if the noise rate is above a certain threshold, then uh, you can simulate the circuit at all depths. But these reverse threshold theorems, they do not apply to current noise rates. So these, uh, although much stronger, these statements don't really apply to, to um, the, the state we're in right now with, with noisy quantum devices. OK, so let me try to give you some, some intuition about what is going on, OK? So um, imagine you prepare the state zero, OK? And here, you want to prepare a circuit that will drive it to its ground state uh, of the Hamiltonian you care about, which is the sigma infinity. So this, this label over here is the inverse temperature, OK? But the noise is driving your system to the maximally mixed state because we assume this one qubit uh, depolarizing noise, right? So in the limit of the depth going to infinity, you're just going to be sampling from the maximally mixed state, OK? So what we can do is that if we are able to quantify how fast this happens in relative entropy, then at each stage of this computation, of like at each step of the circuit, we're gonna be able to assign an inverse temperature for a Gibbs state that has a guarantee to perform at least as well as this uh, noisy quantum circuit, okay? Uh, and then for most problems of practical interest, um, there is an, a range of inverse temperatures from which it is possible to sample from efficiently. Um, and so combining these techniques, we can actually estimate when do we enter this region where it's possible to simulate things efficiently classically. And it turns out that this happens roughly at, at one over P. Okay, so this, this will be uh, the, the general philosophy of, of our approach. Okay, so as I said before, um, the, the main uh, ingredient uh, to, to estimate whenever we lose advantage is to estimate how fast we are converging to this trivial state, the maximally mixed state in relative entropy. So this is the, 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 the first crucial step. And to do this, we resort to uh, so-called uh, strong data processing inequalities. So D here is, is the relative entropy between two states, um, rho and sigma. And sigma is the fixed point of this noise. And usually the data processing inequality tells you that this always holds with mu equals one, but we wanna quantify how fast this has happened. So we, we want the strict inequality. So for instance, if you have a layer of one qubit the polarizing noise, this holds if mu equals one minus p squared. Okay. So um, the the let's say the correct framework to derive such inequalities uh, is so-called uh, are so-called uh, logarithmic sublevel inequalities or modified 
logarithmic Sobolev inequalities. And we know by now um, that they hold for, for many classes of channels, also like uh, correlated noise and um, other examples. So if you wanna learn a bit about state of the art of such uh, strong data processing inequalities or log Sobolev inequalities, uh, maybe I can recommend you the talk by um, Kabir Rizé at last uh, QIP, in which he talked about the state of the art of such um, inequalities. And from an inequality like this one, for instance, for the, the polarizing noise, we actually get that if you take the output of any depth D circuit, it satisfies this inequality over here. And how do we get there? Well, let's prove this. The first step is to note that uh, the relative entropy has this very nice property that it is unitarily invariant. So if I, I can act on, with a unitary on both sides, uh, on, on its both arguments, and it doesn't change its value, right? And as the maximally mixed state is invariant under any unitary, right, I can just act with the inverse of this unitary and peel off like uh, this 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 unitary here has no uh, doesn't change really the value of the raw dimension right okay now the second step is to use our entropic convergence right so as we assume that this t here is a layer of one qubit the polarizing channels we know that this will be smaller than one minus p squared this thing and then we just iterate the argument, right? We now peel off this other unitary and then we apply the, the strong data processing inequality again. And then we, we arrive at this inequality over here after noticing that the, the maximum this, that of value that the relative entropy can take between any state and the maximally mixed state is given by uh, ln2 times n, where n is the number of qubits, okay? So this is how, how you get here. Now, uh, now that we, we know how to quantify how fast you're converging to the maximally mixed state, we need to get to this second, second step, which is relating this then to the inverse temperature of a gift state. How do we do that? Well, you can actually show that if you have, um, that the, the output of the noisy quantum circuit satisfies this inequality over here, okay? So phi d again is the output and sigma beta is a Gibbs state of the Hamiltonian you actually wanna optimize. And um, beta is given by this quantity over here, right? And, and this, this part over here, we know how to control by what I just explained before. Um, and as this is like an optimization problem, we actually wanna minimize this thing, then we only care about lower bounds, right? Because if the energy of this guy over here is lower than the energy of this guy, then for optimization purposes, this one is better, right? We don't really care about uh, getting a two-sided inequality here at this stage. And I should also say, sorry, that this term over here will typically be a multiplicative error. Okay, so um, this shouldn't also worry, we shouldn't worry too much about this. Okay, now that we actually connected the output of the circuit to uh, the, the relative entropy, um, let us prove this. So in order to prove it, you can actually resort to the variational characterization of the relative entropy. So one can actually show that this quantity can be expressed like this. Um, so, I mean, uh, that's just, just a, um, something Pets proved in the late nineties, I think. And um, then you just pick omega as your Gibbs state. And then you apply the mean value theorem. I know I'm going a bit fast here, uh, but it's just like to, to to give you a rough idea of, of how you prove such statements, right? You just use this variational characterization and then uh, pick the, the state in a, in a, in a smart way. Um, and then you play around a bit with the expression and you get statements like the one over here, okay? 
good. So let's now go to the third step, which is, as I mentioned before, right, showing that there is a inverse temperature range for which we know that the uh, classical Gibbs sampling is possible. So um, what we what we see is that if we have such a result, so if there is a beta such that uh, for all beta smaller than beta c, it is possible to sample efficiently from this Gibbs state on a classical computer. We just need to ensure that this term over here is smaller or equal beta c, and then we know that at those depths, the classical computer will perform essentially as well as the, the quantum computer. So let us go back to our guiding example, which are uh, these uh, using Hamiltonians. In this case, um, if you put all the coefficients of the interactions in a matrix A and let A, that sorry, let this be its, its operator norm, then you can show that you can sample efficiently for all beta, which are smaller than one over two, the operator norm of this matrix. And then you can do some basic algebra and arrive at the conclusion that under this one qubit, the polarizing noise model at depths larger than B max, uh, given by this expression over here, uh, this Gibbs state will perform essentially as well. And um, this term over here will typically be of order uh, one, so taking the log of order zero. So we see that what we are, what remains is this term here on the left, which is this one over p scaling I advertised before, right? And uh, so we conclude that at this time, uh, sampling from the skip state sigma beta performs almost as well as this, this noisy quantum computer. Um, and again, this is not a very complicated algorithm, right? This is something that takes uh, n log n, so almost linear uh, in the in the number of, of of spins we have. So not not the most complicated thing ever. Okay, good. Um, so this um, can, for instance, be used to bound the layers of QAOA we can perform. So QAOA is one of the, let's say, uh, leading competitors to achieve uh, quantum advantage with uh, under noise. So in the near term for combinatorial optimization problems. And um, if the, the problem's uh, topology does not match the devices, then usually the, the, the number of layers of physical layers you have to implement to implement one layer of QAOA scale super logarithmically with the system size, with the number of qubits. Um, and if you combine this with the previous result, then it makes it very difficult to achieve speed ups, even with very small error rates, okay? So uh, just to give you some numbers. So we took the scalings of the, the depth required to implement uh, QAOA, uh, from, from the recent Google experiment implementing QAOA on their device. So um, they did run experiments for the SK model, which is a model with all to all connections, right? And also for free regular grounds. And you can tell that uh, in this case, the, the circuit depth uh, scales almost linearly for each layer of, of QAOA. Um, and here like square root, and let's say you would want to implement 10 layers of QAOA or something like this, then uh, you're, you're completely lost, right? I mean, you would, you, if, you, if you wanna do better than, than classical solvers, which currently perform well in uh, say order 10 to the three to 10 to the four uh, spins, then you would require uh, like noise rates of, of 10 to the minus five or something like this. So um, yeah. Uh, you, you would require really small noise rates. And what I'm is, taking here. What, what are these numbers in the table? What does 4,000 mean? Uh, this number? Yeah. Yeah. So so this here is, let's say you had a 10 to the minus 5 noise rate, okay, for the one to with the polarizing channel, sure. and you wanted to implement uh, 10 layers of QAOA, Okay then um, the maximum as the, the number of layers depends on the number of qubits, right? You can also estimate 
what is the maximum number of, of qubits you can run this thing on and uh, still not lose advantage, right? So you, you could just like uh, for, for we, we just get a function in terms of n, uh, sorry, um, we, we can just estimate what is the maximum number of qubits you could actually run this thing before, before actually losing advantage. And this turns out to be 4,380. So this shows you that even if you had like, let's say 10 to the minus five uh, error rates, at least with these scalings, um, uh, you, you would still not uh, be able to have an advantage um, with, with small system sizes, yeah. So, but 4,000 qubits here. Yes, yes. I mean, that's not small. Well, so so your claim I'm there saying, is like I'm an saying, upper bound on on where yes, yeah. what you could do. The the point year. is that like if if you have if you have less than that, then uh, then uh, classical solvers still perform pretty well. So if but you if have, you have like more than that, bound, they they can simulate you know as well. No, let's say you had ten thousand qubits, right? With this, with this scaling of the of the depth you need to impl implement QAOA, advantage would already be lost if you wanted to to implement ten layers. Does this make sense? Because yes. if you had like the, the depth scales with the number of qubits, right? So, sure. So I'm saying that the required depth to implement the thing with ten thousand qubits uh, would already be killed by the noise at ten layers of QAOA. Okay. But if you had less than, say, this four thousand number, then there's a chance that you can't simulate it. Uh, yeah, this is the threshold we get comparing to to high temperature uh, Gibbs sampling. Okay. But um, if I'm gonna sh I'm gonna show you later that um, actually, if you compare, for instance, to STPs, then you can lower this by an like another order of magnitude. So, I mean, we, I would have to run the numerics in principle, but I would estimate that if you compare to SPs, you would probably reduce this number to, let's say, something between 400 and 800. Okay. Um, yeah, and uh, here we also are being actually generous with the, with the device because uh, recent work estimated that you need around 11 layers of QAOA to beat STPs um, with QAOA. Um, so yeah, you, know, you see that as long as long as you have a non-trivial scaling up the depth, um, then you really need ridiculously small noise rates to hope for a speed up. Okay, um, any further questions before I move on? Okay, if not, then let's go exactly to the point where I mentioned uh, that I mentioned before of uh, comparing to practical algorithms. Um, so the, the, the major steps are essentially the same, but the only thing we change is that um, we actually compute uh, a lower bound to the output energy uh, by computing the, the partition function of the problem for some uh, range of betas. So we get an explicit lower bound for the, for the energy of the output, right? And if you run some classical algorithm, whatever algorithm you want, and this algorithm out, outputs you something with a better energy, right? Then you have a certificate that at this step, the, the quantum computer cannot outperform your, your, your device. So um, again, the, the whole scheme is, is kind of similar up to this, this part where we compute the, the partition function. So what you can show um, using, again, this, this variational principle is that the energy um, of, of the output satisfies this lower bound. So here we only have the, the partition function and here this relative entropy, which we can again uh, control by the same methods as before. And again, it is typically the case that for some range of betas, you can actually compute this partition function efficiently or at least approximate it. So what you can do is just evaluate this bound for this value, for, the, for all the values of betas you still manage to compute, right? And then just optimize over these betas for which you can actually compute what this thing is. Uh, and you always have to promise that there is a non-trivial range uh, for which this is the case, right? Um, and then you get a lower bound 
on the output's energy. And so this is exactly how it would work. You, you would first estimate the partition function or the range for which this is feasible. Um, you just estimate what this relative entropy here would be uh, in terms of the noise model, as I showed you before. Then we evaluate this bound for different values of beta. Then you run this classical algorithm you have, don't really care what it is. And then you just compare, right? Uh, and in principle, if this one outputs like a state with a smaller energy, then uh, you don't expect the quantum computer to actually improve on it at a certain depth, right? So just as an example, uh, uh, what I mentioned before, uh, we took uh, an, uh, an instance of the GSET of instances. These are instances which are usually used to uh, benchmark max cut solvers. And we ran this, um, this um, um, lower bound, or like we, we, we computed the partition function for this instance and compared uh, what is the, and sorry, computed what is the, the energy, the, this lower bound, right? And here we compared against like a heuristic algorithm. Here we compared to the STP relaxation, so the energy you obtain uh, for those procedures. And here, this high temperature quantum dip sampling. And uh, by doing this, we conclude that roughly uh, at depth 0 0.18 times p to the minus one, uh, already this, this STP, which is something you, you can run in, in seconds on your laptop. So this is like an STP with of dimension 800. And with some new techniques, you can really run this in seconds on your laptop. We expect this 800 qubit device to actually lose advantage. Okay. Um, now, all I explained really uh, only works for for unital noise. So once that map the maximally mixed state to the to the maximally mixed state. So um, why is that? Well, if you recall, we had this. The first step of the proof was actually to peel off this unitary over here. But if our noise is not driving our system to the maximally mixed state anymore, then this doesn't really work, right? So uh, the proof really breaks down if, if this is not the case anymore. Um, and well, there's also good reason for that because if this, this channel T is non neural anymore, then uh, fault tolerance is possible. So in this other paper I mentioned at the beginning by, by Gottesman, this quantum refrigerator, Gottesman and, and others uh, showed that um, if the fixed point is not the maximally mixed state, then you can run this, this uh, what they call the quantum refrigerator, and you can actually do computations for an exponential time before a threshold, right? So going beyond this, this uh, unital noise model is, is quite challenging because, well, of course, we cannot expect to, to um, and say that for any circuit you're running, you'll, you'll be overtaken by, overtaken by classical method because we know that fault tolerance principle is possible in this setting and you could do computations for exponential time, right? So um, we sort of have to specialize to certain circuits. And luckily, uh, what we can show is the following generalized version of the entropic conversions we had before. So um, we can show that the same inequality we had before, which is this part, actually also holds if you add these corrections over here. Okay, so this term over here is so-called max relative entropy. Don't really, I don't want to really get into what it is, but it's like a generalize it like a different version of the relative entropy, let's say. Um, and it, this part here quantifies how much the, the unitary changes the fixed point of the quantum channel at each step. Um, and again, with the maximally mixed state, this will be zero. So this reduces to the, what we had before, right? Um, and this term is then exponentially suppressed. Okay, uh, so we, we have this, this exponential suppression here. So whatever you do, but note that this this goes this this term over here uh, increases as t goes to zero. So at the beginning of the circuit. So whatever you do 
in the beginning of the circuit, if it changes the, the, the fixed point a lot, we don't care as much. It's only problematic if what we're doing at the end really changes it, right? So um, to prove this, we actually use the data process triangle inequality by Müller, Hermes, and Kastanbe. But I want to show you that this setting where the, the fixed point is preserved at the end of the circuit is actually quite uh, natural for some of the, the, the proposals we have. So again, QAOA. So how does QAOA work, right? Um, we apply layers of, of unitaries where one layer is given just by uh, the exponent, like the, the Hamiltonian we actually want to find the ground state of and just a simple um, poly X Hamiltonian, right? And then we just find good parameters uh, and, and, and measure the output energy. However, um, let us now assume that our noise is driving us to a classical state, which is, I guess, a very well-founded assumption saying that, yes, I don't know, you have some sort of decoherence combined with some sort of amplitude damping. Uh, so, Note that we're not assuming that uh, tau is equal to zero here, not, in the, not necessarily maximally mixed, but I mean, this is a, a, just a toy model, right? Then in this setting, uh, the, the, the target Hamiltonian will not change the fixed point, right? Because everybody commutes, everybody is diagonal. And thus we see that the only terms that actually con contribute are these H zero terms, which are poly axis, right? Uh, and, um, for the routing, uh, you would actually implement some swap gates, which also do not change the fixed point. So this is fine. So the only term that actually contributes is this H0 term. And the next observation is that for good parameters of QAOA, we actually have that uh, this H0 part should go to zero. So like in, in, in annealing protocols. And this implies that uh, this contribution here will also go to zero, right? So for instance, in this paper by Zhu et al, they, they compute what is the best, um, what are the best values for QAOA on, on the SK model. And we see um, that indeed, uh, what I mentioned before is correct. The, the values of the target Hamiltonian increase, increase while the, the values for, for uh, the X part go to zero, right? So the circuit will leave the, the target, the, the, the fixed point of the noise invariant at, large, at late stages. And then we can work uh, as we did uh, before and just have to change things a little bit. So we actually have to change before, we didn't have this term over here, which was uh, the log of the fixed point of the noise because now we have to take care of bias, right? Because the noise is biasing our output, say, towards zero. Uh, so if we just take the sigma as before, which was just this tensor product of uh, each to the minus uh, tau z's, then we're just adding a external field uh, to this to this Hamil the Gibbs state over here. And usually adding a external field doesn't really change the threshold temperature at which you can sample efficiently. So we see that we kind of recover the same picture as before, but now in this more um, general setting. And last but not least, um, I would just like to quickly uh, comment on annealers because they are just like a natural, or let's say QAOA is actually a natural extension of annealers, of course. Um, so in this scenario, we need to generalize uh, the entropic convergence bounds we had before to, to continuous time, because these, this is like a continuous time computational model, right? So just to generalize the noise model we had before, I'm going to assume that uh, we have a quantum annealer that is implementing this time-dependent Hamiltonian HT here. Uh, but we're also going to add a time independent noise here. So this is this Limbladian L um, and sigma is its, is its fixed point, right? And in this setting, uh, given an inequality like this one, which replaces this entropic convergence we had before, 
we can actually show that the relative entropy decays like this. So this is just a generalization of what we had before for QAOA, but in continuous time, we see that as long as this Hamiltonian uh, leaves the, the state sigma invariant at late times, this contribution like this, this thing over here will go to zero, right? Because early time contributions are exponentially suppressed. Uh, and to prove this, you just have to discretize the discussion we had before, uh, discretize this uh, process over here and use the previous bounds we had. And just to illustrate what we get, um, let's pick uh, a toy model for the noise, which is something which uh, interpolates uh, between just the, the polarizing noise I had before and amplitude damping. Um, and this is, so uh, amplitude damping would correspond to tau being infinity and uh, the polarizing to tau being zero, sorry, gamma being zero. This should be tau actually, sorry. Um, and this is actually, a, of course, a time model of what's going on. But uh, if you combine the main sources of noise in the annealers, which are amplitude damping, control errors in the phasing, this is what actually comes out. So it's probably also not completely uh, unmotivated, I would say. Then um, you could actually show that uh, if you take the annealing path to just be this, this linear interpolation, between this, this H0, just the sigma X Hamiltonian and this Ising Hamiltonian, then the, the relative entropy um, after this T annealing time is upper bounded by this. And um, so, yeah, I think I don't have enough time to get into the details here, but maybe just let me point out what is going on. Um, so, First of all, we see that this, this term over here indeed goes to, to zero as t, the annealing time goes to infinity. Um, and again, this, this will reach a threshold after which this thing will uh, perform as well as it keeps sampling after a constant time, which I find um, surprising because, I mean, as I mentioned before, um, in principle, one could do um, exponential time computations in this uh, with this device, right? Resorting to, to error correction. But if you implement this particular circuit, right? Then then after which has no error correction, it just really interpolates between uh, these two Hamiltonians. Then after constant time, uh, our bounds predict that you're going to lose um, advantage. So that's I find um, surprising. Um, and you see that, uh, however, that things are, the, the bound is not as strong as before, right? Because first of all, we have this R squared, um, be, where before we just had uh, a dependence on, on P, right? So it's, it's quadratically worse, this, this rest term we obtained because of the noise being non-unital. And um, moreover, the dependency on, on time is, is polynomial. Whereas over here, uh, we of course see it, it's exponential. So uh, the qualitative behavior, sorry, um, although we still get this constant time bound, it's it's not, I mean, we, we can really see that having this, this um, more general noise model also makes us pay a price. But then again, you could estimate what is the, the maximum annealing time you could um, have given like the, the relevant noise parameters. But yeah, maybe let's let's skip that and go to the conclusion. So um, I think that one the, the first take home message of this work is that if the topology of the device does not match the problems as we had in these uh, QAOA tables I've showed you before, then it's I, I find it unlikely that these variational algorithms will uh, offer any advantage um, in the NISC era, because then the, the circuit depth will have to scale with, with, with system size. And then we see that very um, like very low noise rates will be required for, for these sorts of arguments not to, to kick in. And I think that another nice thing is that now we have this framework to assess what is the opportunity window for, for quantum speedups. Uh, we have like a good, at least uh, a non-trivial way of, of comparing 
how well we can expect these, these um, variational algorithms to perform against methods that are well established uh, without having actually having to, to simulate these, these very complicated uh, noisy devices. And I, as I mentioned before, you could play this whole game I played for, for quantum problems, but there the opportunity window is a bit larger. So um, first of all, because while you know, sampling from, from high temperature quantum Gibbs states is more challenging than classical ones, it's also a less studied uh, problem, I would say. And uh, at least to me, it, it seems like uh, for, for many quantum problems we care about, it's more natural to, to, to have them in say like a 2D topology or something like that. So there seems to be a, a larger opportunity window there. And there are also some, some clear, clearly there's some open questions. So for instance, what is the impact um, that uh, error mitigation or primitive error correction techniques would have on, on our conclusions. Uh, so we, we have some, we're working uh, on that right now. And most importantly, um, I think that um, all, all the analysis I've shown you was like a first order analysis, right? I only showed you uh, how the expectation values behave and it would of course be quite relevant to, to lift this to um, concentration inequalities to actually say like, oh, with, with high probability, you're gonna also um, observe an energy in, in that range predicted by the bounds. So I think that's, that's another important um, open problem, I would say that we're also working on. And I would also really like to perform larger scale numerics of, of, of our bound. So like see, see how well it performs for, for some um, more interesting quantum problems, for instance. Um, and I think it would also be quite worthwhile to do a more specialized analysis because the, the, one of the main ingredients of our bounds consisted of this entropic convergence inequality, right? And this bound is state agnostic. So uh, it doesn't really care about the, the particular circuit, uh, sorry, the particular uh, state you have. And in principle, the relative entropy could decrease much more under noise than, than what I've shown you. So um, in principle, um, the, the relative entropy could shrink must, much faster than uh, this state independent bound would predict. So I think it would also be interesting to see if like for, for some uh, proposals, um, this, this is indeed the case, right? Because then our, our bounds would also improve. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And yeah, do you have any questions? Thanks, Daniel. Let's unmute and try to clap in synchronized fashion in three, two, one. I don't know if that ever works, but thank you for a very nice talk and a Thanks. relatively gentle introduction.